Hello and welcome to another episode of the Smarter Tech Podcast. I'm Nick, the EMF Guy Pino, and today I have the immense privilege to interview Nikki Florio. Uh, Nikki, please let us know a little bit about your background. Today we're talking in particular about pollinators. I know you have work in different topics, different spheres, but please let Start there, a little bit of your background, education, and what has led you to think and research and publish education about the really the mass extinction event that pollinators worldwide and other uh, non-pollinators as well. I think all insects are in big trouble right now. So please tell us a little bit about the, your story. Um. When I was a kid, I grew up in, in central California and then moved out to Lake Tahoe, um, which is a really a, a beautiful place on the California Nevada border when I was about 21. And I really loved the environment and ended up um, uh, going to college up there. And I, I got degrees in natural sciences and humanities with a focus on environmental psychology. And then I went back to school because I wanted to teach Um, so, uh, I went through the, through the educational, uh, program at the university. And when I got done with that, I started an environmental education program and, uh, it was an integrated program, uh, when the the true form of sustainability, it was a sustainable business (laughs) lifestyles and education program. And I ran that for 10 years. I was outside um, hundreds of days a year. I did uh, elementary school through high school. And then we did supplemental uh, collegiate programs. And because we were we were natural sciences and sustainability, we taught students about uh, consumerism, conscious consumerism and the mm. impacts you have on that planet. And so, you know, during that time, I was also doing uh, sustainability consulting and and. Not- not the same type that you see today. We did product service practice, and we, we really we really um, graded through to ensure that we weren't promoting greenwash companies. And um, you know, sometimes things like that would fall through. Back then, uh, when when solar was was really starting to come out, I was promoting it. Um, but then, I, when I looked at the full LCA, the life cycle assessment, I found out how you know very not eco-friendly it is and and then around 2009 um between 2005 2009 there were little differences but around 2009 i started noticing big uh, anomalies with weather and climate and the behavior of animals and and what was happening in the forest with plants and down in the desert on the other side and um and then i i would google these issues and they would come up as geoengineering and i had never heard of it uh didn't never heard of it at all in college i had learned about weather modification um so over the next couple years i i was i was studying it and and meeting different um, scientists and physicians and whistleblowers and then uh, i started be heroic in 2014 out in colorado and that's a it's it's a it's a um, climate and pollinator project put very simply, but it's, it's mostly addressing the issues and impacts and, and solutions around the current, um, mass extinction event. Now, when you, when you present on issues like, um, a- a- agrochemical, a lot of people today know about that way back in, you know, early two thousands, they didn't, but, but more than that today, issues that, that people think, uh, we were discussing earlier, the people think our uh, conspiracy theories are things like the dangers of, of 5G and geoengineering. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, is that, is that a good? Yeah, is for sure. Bad? For sure. That's it. That's a good start. So you've, you've studied the different, um, different aspects that impact nature and pollinators kind of realizing that something is deeply wrong. I know that when it comes to wireless scientists have emitted concerns for decades about you know the impacts that it could have on humans and then well if humans are impacted it's very likely that all of biology is impacted rats are impacted bacteria are impacted and also nature whether it's plants animals everything in between including insects and there are good reviews i can uh, put it in the show notes there's a three-part review that has been published by 
Um, several scientists, including, uh, if I recall correctly, journalist uh, Levitt, Blake Levitt, I, if I recall correctly. So anyway, uh, there's a very good review about what we know about radio frequency, radiation, and other types of man-made frequencies and nature. But the reality is, all of this is a big experiment, right? It's been rolled out first. Now we kind of realize that it might be part of one of the factors impacting nature. How did you personally realize or, or read first read the research around electropollution and, and the impacts on nature? Because I find that a lot of people that are environmentally uh, minded, including most, if not all big um, worldwide environmentalist organizations, do not include wireless pollution as a potential factor uh, impacting nature. It seems like uh, it's one of these untouchable topics at the moment. Uh, yes, that that's very true. If you're if you're going through uh, like World Wildlife Fund or or um, Audubon Society or the Nature Conservancy, those are those are usually funded by big oil or other or, or other. Um, negative types of industries. So the way they suppress geoengineering is the same way they suppress uh, suppress uh, five five G IoT issues. The, the the different technologies within that, and um, so so we have. I've approached uh, hundreds of of science groups from um, from. Uh, butterfly and plant preservation, you know, small, um, small groups all the way to the, the, the big guys. And it's, it's very rare that anyone will look beyond any mainstream issues, even with, even with agrochemical, even, even with the, the, the technologies, uh, bio and nanoengineering and genetically engineered trees and plants and, and things like that. People just, they won't take a deep dive. Americans especially are are just intellectually obese. They, they want to be spoon fed, you know, all this all this junk, and then they just their brain it just sits there, and they don't they don't actually proactively go out and see what's going on. They they more need to be told them, and and part of that is the university systems in in the U.S. and and a lot of places around the world actually are are funded by agrochemical and telecommunications and then billionaires like Bill Gates who have specific agendas. So certain things are, are, are intentionally omitted. Um, and, and, you know, the, the EMFs are that are impacting nature. Um, and, and all of the, the other technologies are, but I learned about it. Um, I, I learned about the, the, basically the wireless industry's impacts um i didn't learn about until around 2011 when when the insect populations around the, the towers and the bird populations around the towers were affected okay uh, is there a specific study you saw around 2011 i don't i, I wasn't aware of that date in particular what happened then oh so in, in 2011 was the was the, the the kind of the the initial rollout of the 4g uh for, uh, of the, the fourth generation so that the towers were doing testing. And, and so there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of testing going on and, and, you know, birds, that was the first time that we heard birds falling from the sky. Mm. And, uh, and then with insects, um, it, it changes behavior in, in different insects in different ways, but honeybees, because a lot of people know about honeybees and because they're so important to agriculture, um, beekeepers were discussing it and, and it was, it was this, it was the beekeepers, not the scientists who, who first noticed changes in behavior and, and empty hives, uh, the, the, the bees would just be gone. They'd be there one day, you know, 60,000, 20,000 bees in a, in a hive and they'd be, they'd be gone. So they, the, you know, in the, in that, in that industry, they were talking to each other and that kind of brought to light what was happening. But but um, 5G impacts all pollinators and the, the fact that humans, we can't live without, we can't live without pollinators. We, we could never have evolved. Uh, well, we could have evolved, but not, not to the degree that we have today with, without them because mm -hmm. they're, 
they've stabilized ecosystems. Um, they, they pollinate, um, you know, millions of billions of trees and plants on the, on the planet. And, and the foods that we get, the most nutrient dense foods, fruits and vegetables and nuts, um, those come from these animals and, and they're not just bees. It's the, the entire scope of winged and terrestrial insects and birds and bats and small mammals sometimes. And, and, uh, and other animals, and they're all affected different ways with with uh, the the millimeter waves of of five G especially. And then in the in the ocean, I mean, the ocean plants are are water pollinated; they're wave you know uh, pollinated. But uh, but because five G is is uh, is is now in our oceans, and you know we have satellite to to base structures in the oceans, it's having horrific impacts on on. The very base of the food chain, there's a zooplankton and phytoplankton. Um, and this is on top of all of our plastics and Fukushima and all that. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Ocean, yeah. My God. Yeah. And what I saw around around bees lately, I did uh, talk to Professor Holly Johansson, who has taken on in the last few years uh, a, a huge concern, has been having a concern about, around pollinators and kind of trying to focus some of areas of his research, although I think he's kind of str struggling with funding right now. And um, I'm trying to help him a little bit, but it's it's very complicated to study bees and it kind of install some, you can install sorts of sensors you mentioned in the hive to see how the bees react and, and how the bees communicate with each other, kind of decode what they think of the signals, right? When you introduce signals and what they realized in one study is that the bees were basically behaving as if they're being attacked by another species. Uh, so they're com becoming completely crazy, you know, and eventually they get exhausted and then probably just leave, but they're kind of fighting an invisible enemy in a sense, uh, feeling like something is very wrong here. And uh, it might be because their communication uh, ability is, is or, or sensing ability of the environment is completely destroyed. That was an, an, another thing that was um, mentioned is their, their ability to locate themselves and find their hive in the first place. So it's it's impacting all of these insects in one way and another. But what was mentioned also in when I looked at what could impact pollinators, it's also the word the worldwide use of different chemicals, including glyphosate. But do talk a little bit more about geoengineering. Where does it come in that whole story? Because I. I don't know exactly what to think about it. I know there are programs that are publicly available by governments, by military, where they're trying to do things that in my mind are just as crazy as the satellites project by Elon Musk, Starlink, but there are so many different corporations that want to put satellites. And to me, it is crazy, irresponsible, reckless. And yet I know that it's true and credible. It, it's happening out there and most people are not even concerned about, you know, the <laughs> impacts on, on anything, whether it's nature or humans. So I know that, for example, Bill Gates and other billionaires have said, oh, we should block out the sun and use this and that. And these ideas, I just see them on paper and they really look like very, very, very bad ideas. Because it's like, okay, well, will it really, if they do try to block out the sun with, I don't know, like a tarp, I don't know what they want to do. But imagine like they want to use a tarp over a country to block out the sun and instead we're going to use LEDs. I don't know. I don't know what their thoughts are about these things. It's kind of really crazy. But will they really review all the possible downstream consequences before rolling out the technology? If we look at history, the answer is no. <laughs> That's the thing. It's never done. So what what's the deal with geoengineering? What do we know about it? And how is it potentially impacting nature, including pollinators? Um, so so geoengineering, for, for your listeners that, that don't know what it is, um, is defined um, as deliberate large-scale intervention in Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if you if you start with the the whole climate change issue, um, yeah. older people when when we when, when 
when when I first learned about uh, climate change, it was actually called the greenhouse effect. And then it changed, the terminology changed to global warming, but now we're having freezing events. So they're calling it climate change. And uh, weather modification programs themselves have been taking place for well over 70 years. Now, when when science foundations like Harvard and Oxford and and um, and and Stanford University and then any partnerships with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association or Scripps um, uh, um, or UC San Diego or wherever these these universities are all over the world that do these projects. Um, uh, including in Colorado, the, the foundations like NCAR, the National um, Atmospheric Research Center and things like that, they work in conjunction with these universities on different science projects. And you mentioned Bill Gates. Um, Bill Gates is a primary funder for uh, Pfizer, which is the Fund for Innovative Climate Research out of Harvard. And they they work on geoengineering projects and he uh, he funds um, uh, several geoengineering um, projects out of that in, in particular. And then in 2010, uh, in, in 2010, he uh, he did his own uh, geoengineering project, funded his own uh, geoengineering project in uh, in the Pacific. And this went against the the uh, the the. the the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, because you're not supposed to geoengineer over over oceans, but the U.S. didn't agree to that um, to, to that kind of uh, uh, agreement. And after the U.S. flooded out the Ho Chi Minh Trail and flooded out North Korea and ended the war using um, using uh, cloud seeding technologies, uh, there's a there's a treaty that the United Nations uh, designed called the NMOD or Environmental Modification Treaty that stated that geoengineering is not to be used for warfare. Mm. Now, up until uh, up until uh, about the, the the mid 80s, or early 90s, and there, there was weather modification projects in the U.S. or they were building up these technologies. It would be in, in, in publications um, like Popular Science or in local newspapers, and there's a wonderful outline of, of uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles from all over the country and all over the world on weathermodificationhistory.com. And so people can go back and see this this full history of of public uh, of public weather modification and geoengineering projects. Now, um, the the objective for science is to you were talking about blocking the sun. That's called solar radiation management. So that's one of the technologies. The second technology is carbon dioxide removal. So, okay. so we've turned carbon into a really, uh, into a huge bad guy or they, yeah. they have. Yeah. And, and, you know, they said, Oh, you know, there's too many cows. Cows are farting and, and gasoline is bad. And, and you don't ever want to upset the balance of the atmosphere and to put too much of any particular gas in the atmosphere. But uh, we're going to have a little quick chat, if it's OK, on on greenhouse, uh, the, 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 the greenhouse um, issue, greenhouse gases all the way up to uh, uh, up to climate change, the, the difference in that. And and then what we're seeing today and then people can can openly compare climate change to climate engineering. Is that OK? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know much about this. I'm looking forward to this because I think it's going to make it a little bit less confusing for me to uh, talk about it in an intelligent way. Yeah, it's it just weathermodificationhistory.com. I did take a look at it uh, preparing for this interview and I was like, oh my God. Okay, well, it looks like there's literally, you know, it's been years and, 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 and decades and decades of experimentation around that stuff at the minimum publicly open then we're not talking about military technology we're not talking about undisclosed programs which there always are from all governments it's like this is happening all the time so it really blew my mind so uh please please go ahead and uh, tell us the difference and walk us through it okay and and um and and just for your listeners if they're interested on on beheroic.com um we have a geoengineering page that has links to to all of these different groups including uh weather modification history uh so so they can they can they can check it out so perfect uh, do you want me to show you the 
Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please, go, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, did you want me to? Do you want me to show you some slides while I'm, yeah. while I'm talking? Or do you want me to just okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, um. So. Uh, so this is a this is an a, a presentation I did for uh, for environmental and human uh, for for fire agencies and things like that and agriculture, but uh, this has, has a lot of the info that we're going to be discussing. So um, so one of the things about geoengineering as well is geoengineering is the foundational technology for five uh, G and the IoT because because you have to control moisture in the atmosphere in order to uh, in, in order to have, um, in, in order to have consistent communication. So, uh, so you want to be able to control the, the, the environment. And in, uh, when, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was president, um, before he was president, when he was vice president, he, he addressed uh, a major university discussing weather modification. And he stated Oh, very openly that if you control the weather, you can control the world. So um, the U.S. military has been involved in, in weather modification for, for decades. And on weather modification history, you can see Project Cloverleaf and everything like that. So with climate, uh, with climate change versus um, climate engineering, the, the, the first thing that we need to know is that there is a difference between climate and weather. People, uh, you know, people are talking about climate change and and this little pigtail girl, whatever her name is, you know, she's now a, she's now got her doctorate in theology and she's like 18 years old and just barely finished high school. And she doesn't probably know the difference between weather and climate. Um, the the uh, Greta chick. Anyway, so mm -hmm. uh, weather is the state of our atmosphere, right? It's it's what's occurring in the atmosphere and and. It's what's occurring right now and kind of a, a, a seasonal effect. But climate is something that's taking place over a long period of time. And if you're looking at global climate, those there's little there's little um, there there's um, differences in climate stability in different regions because of topography, because of the, these variables. So the first variable in weather is the season. It's your proximity to the sun. And that affects how warm it is, what your winds are going to be like, um, and then how cold it is, et cetera. And then also the landforms. Uh, if you're if you're next to uh, if there's a bunch of farmland that, that goes out for you know several thousand acres and then it butts up against a mountain range and it's summertime, then the plants are going to be transpiring and creating you know beautiful white billowy cumulus clouds and they pass across the, the the valley and then when they get to the edge of the mountainside they build up. And when it gets really hot, um, they'll build up into thunder showers and, and rain out. So that's the that's one of the one of the landform uh, made created uh, types of, of weather in, in an area. But also your proximity to the water. Are you are you near a river valley or, or are you near a lake, uh, a large lake or the ocean or whatever? Because that's going to be evaporating uh, and, and it also create a temperate uh, environment in some cases. And then what are the plants? Because plants also transpire. And in places like rainforests, for example, you know, big, healthy rainforests, they create their own cloud systems and uh, create their own their, their own their own water and uh, different plants uh, behave differently. And so if you if, if you have a system that's that's built up and you hit a you hit a mountain range and on the backside, uh, if it's a big enough mountain range and the moisture is all released, you'll see on the backside that there's a desert, kind of like on the, the leeward side of the Sierra Nevadas or the Rockies. Mm -hmm. So that's called the rain shadow effect. So so landforms will do that and, and weather. And then you also have volcanic events and fires and things like that. So so we're seeing all of these extremes in weather. We're seeing extreme drought and flooding and, and ice events and things like that. So when they change the, the terminology it's because something else is happening. Otherwise, it would still be called the greenhouse effect. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you go into a greenhouse, if you think about a greenhouse, a greenhouse is just a smaller version of Earth. You know, we're encapsulated in our at, you know our atmosphere is our is our is our greenhouse. It's it's what holds our atmosphere. If you go into a building that's a greenhouse, that's that building's atmosphere. So in a sensory manner which uh, your senses what you smell 
see here, feel. The first thing you notice, if you go into a greenhouse and it's a large greenhouse, uh, you'll notice that when you walk in, you know, it's very warm in there and it's very moist. It's, it's humid because the plants are transpiring and releasing moisture. And sometimes so much so that, that you'll get moisture dripping down the walls. Yeah. And then, and then other things that occur in there is they're very fragrant because the plants are taking up nutrients from the soil and, and the, the, the terpenes are expressing, you know, different scents. And so they're very fragrant. And then within these buildings, um, they have really, you know, good oxygen levels. People feel good. Same thing when you have plant, a lot of plants in your house because, because plants release oxygen and, um, and uh, carbon dioxide is so important to greenhouses that commercial greenhouses buy huge carbon emitters. Now, okay. what's happening? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, that's uh, counterintuitive. So, so uh, they, they do that because in the winter, there's less carbon in the atmosphere. So, the, so they put these carbon emitters in to keep the, the, the plants absorbing them. Hmm. And, and then they, and then they, they, they uh, flourish. So what we're seeing on Earth today for the past 30 years uh, is we've seen huge uh, lowering of humidity levels globally and do. Uh, and just just one example is in uh, in the Central Valley of California, San Joaquin, Sacramento Valleys. Uh, they no longer have fog in the wintertime. If they do, it might be one or two days a year instead of, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, each month in the winter months. And um, and then also uh, in the meadows, in the high mountains, if you walk through meadows, um, you know, 20 years ago, your your pant legs would be soaking wet in the morning until about 10 a.m. in the summertime because the because the wind, the wind, you know, slows and stills at night because there's not that thermal effect. And so the, the moisture condenses and comes down. And then uh, globally, also oxygen levels are dropping. And. Uh, another thing that's happening ha happening is that the the plants are not are are uh, are are no longer as fragrant as they used to be. You can you can walk or drive through entire forests, um, and you don't even you don't even smell the pines anymore. You go through you go through um, uh, deserts, and you don't smell sages anymore. You can crest hills going to to the ocean, and you don't smell that rich, briny, salty air. Uh, in fact, some some young people and kids have no idea what the ocean and, and, and trees and forests and deserts used to smell like because they're, that smell is no longer there. And so that uh, there, there are things that, that, you know, oh, this is one of the this is just an example of one of the carbon dioxide generators for a 5000 square foot uh, greenhouse. So. um Carbon, there are things that it doesn't do. Carbon dioxide doesn't cause a uh, weather whiplash where you have a, you know, 70 plus degree difference uh, in, in a state that's only, you know, less than a thousand miles wide. And, and you don't get freezing pockets and, and hot, hot pockets in, in continents. And you don't have, you know, carbon dioxide can't cause extremes uh, like you're seeing on these maps, extreme colds on one side of the country. And extreme heat on the other or extreme dry and wet. And, and yet we have these record events, uh, record heat and record drought and record flooding happening all the time. And the systems in the northern hemisphere always go from east to west. We've had the same topography, uh, same landforms um, on continents for, you know, <laughs> for since the beginning of time, basically. Um, and so... So uh, when you when you have all of these uh, all of these different issues, um, these are not caused from from carbon dioxide. I mean, what you're seeing here is a plant that has completely died on top, and it's sprouting out of the base and sprouting out of the trunk. Uh, and then you see you know dead and dying leaves uh, on trees, and and you have weather whiplash in the springtime. Uh, for example, in California, we had we had a, a you know a huge winter. We had an engineered atmospheric river coming through, and they they uh, they stopped it for a bit. And plants had budded out. Uh, trees, for example, had started leafing, so they had little buds. And then they dropped the temperature so quickly that they seared, 
And so what you're seeing on the left is the result of, of it's, it, these are, you know, early spring leaves that are burned. This isn't from, uh, California, but this is happening this very minute in California. These are from Colorado when they did the same thing. And then you're, there's also problems with the, the burning of leaves uh, when you have, uh, when you have uh, solar radiation issues. Now, carbon dioxide also doesn't cause plants that are getting plenty of water to die on the top and only sprout out of the center. And it doesn't cause rust, rot, mold, leaf discoloration, and all these other problems we're seeing in every blade of grass and every leaf on the planet right now. And carbon dioxide doesn't cause plants to flash out dead. So, so when, we're, when we're looking at these, you know, at, at all of these different issues, the problem um, is geoengineering. And as I mentioned before, it's deliberate large-scale intervention in Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. So we were discussing the science foundations and their objectives are to block sunlight and draw carbon. But with military and commercial geoengineering, the objectives are different. So their history, if you're researching the history of geoengineering to help with climate change, that's a, that's a different area of study. So if you're Googling things, that's what you're going to find or searching, whatever search engine you have. Um, so, so with the different research and development institutions, you know, these are, these are some very well-known ones, but there's hundreds of them. There's geoengineering programs in universities all over the world right now. And what they're doing is they're telling these young people that carbon is the problem and this technology is the solution without providing a balanced history of the, the current projects and things that are uh, that, that are happening. So these are just two quick examples of the studies that that a, that a U.S. and a U.K. university do. So uh, on this map right here, you can see the effectiveness versus affordability of different geoengineering technologies. And then the colors, the green means it's safe. The, the, the red and orange means it's not safe. So carbon sequestration at the source is fairly affordable and fairly effective and afforestation or planting forests. And these, they don't mean natural, beautiful, diverse forests. All of this research is done specifically to plant genetically engineered forests and genetically engineered crops. So yeah. the people fund, funding these university programs like Gates and, and agrochemical companies, they want to make money off of this climate uh, climate change lie. So with stratospheric aerosols, they're very affordable. You already have, you know, thousands and thousands of jets in the, in the air. And, uh, but, and they're very effective at blocking sunlight. Uh, but they're not healthy for the environment because those aerosols come down and get into soils and plants and pollinators. And, uh, and then uh, Oxford's does cooling readiness versus cost. So aerosol geoengineering is, is very effective and affordable, um, where space mirrors are a little less affordable, but we, we already have all of these technologies from ship tracks to uh, biochar and ocean fertilization. We've been doing this uh, for, for several decades now. Uh, this is just a, a quick example of David Keith discussing uh, how geoengineering is based on risk to risk decisions. Uh, and that geoengineering aerosols are, are inexpensive. And he says, for the same reason, you know, this is a nanomaterial. You don't have to load up a bunch of planes. You can take a handful of planes even and go up into the stratosphere. And, you know, the stratosphere comes down to, I think, uh, around, you know, anywhere from 25 to 30,000 feet. It's not way, way up that the very low, low end of the stratosphere. So, so they can engineer this, this whole thing. And, he discusses it as not being a moral hazard, but more like free, free riding on our grandkids. So just in the technology of blocking sunlight, you are going to have massive impacts on the planet. Every living thing on Earth, almost every living thing on Earth, except for like microbes in caves and animals at the very bottom of the ocean and things like that. We all need sunlight to live. Plants need it to, for photosynthesis uh, and, and we need it obviously to produce vitamin D and be healthy and all mammals need it. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, 
makes us happy or, you know, it gives us healthy, healthy skin and makes us feel good with sunlight. So, um, you know, just using Bill Gates as an example, he's a huge investor in geoengineering and he's a huge investor in agrochemical companies and, and uh, bio and nanotechnology companies. He owns a half a million shares of Monsanto. He's got his fingers in all the dirty agrochemical bio and nano engineering pies. And he, uh, he funds programs like uh, Monsanto's projects to make plants that, that, uh, that can grow in low light that photosynthesize without the sun or um, also all of the new indoor agriculture. He's, he's, for example, funding a huge project for mRNA lettuce, indoor lettuce that's now being sold at, at um, Costco and other, other stores. So, so it's, there's a big crossover in agrochemical and pharmaceutical and geoengineering. So um, this is a, a woman, Professor Catherine Rickey, who discusses uh, how, to, how to make geoengineering um, not, not make people pause you know, she wants to help people not be tentative in exercising their their rights to geoengineer the planet. Well, we have yeah. one. Yeah. Can, so, I, can I pause for a second? Can you come oh, back yeah. to the last slide? Because it really made it made me freak out. The alumina, the last line here, the alumina, so aluminum, uh, we've only begun to research. It was 2014, like almost 10 years ago, and published nothing. We yes. haven't done anything serious on aluminum, so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow. We haven't looked at it. Are you kidding me? Are, are, yes. are, they, are they actively using a product that they have no idea what the consequences will be? Is oh. that how it works? No. See, they couldn't possibly not know what the consequences of these are because the research has been going on for decades. So David Keith is uh, part of the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. It's funded by Bill Gates. But David Keith is also a big investor in geoengineering. Yeah. He's got a geoengineering company. And today or tomorrow, I can't remember which day it is, he's hosting a geoengineering um a, a, a geoengineering meeting in on the east coast to discuss the governance of geoengineering with a bunch of other geoengineering leaders uh, which do not include any non-party funded uh physicians or scientists for sure yeah classic okay so yeah. they have um and tell, tell me this, I guess something that I have not been clear for, for years and years is, are there, people talk about geoengineering as if it's something that is happening is when, when we're, we're thinking about projects that are happening right now, are these all military tests, research projects and other things that people are worried about that are using aluminum right now or certain things to block out the sun or reduce I, I i'm, I'm kind of confused about the fact that some people um talk about these these exposures that are impacting pollinators i i don't have the the link yet in my mind about how this works is this the current research projects are already so, spraying the planet oh yes so so right now there are at any given time there are, are, are there are projects going on all the time okay what uh this the science foundations that that execute projects um they do it sometimes independently other times so so the three objectives are are science foundations and then military, which, you know, you can see here some of the older documents and there's, there's thousands of these. Um, uh, so, you know, in 1966, they were discussing uh, recommended national plan on weather modification and weather modification programs, policy and potential. And then they do things like hurricane modification workshops. And so the, the more, the, the more well-known documents, this is one of the more well-known documents um, by the U S air force. And we have, we have links on our presentation so people can, you know, we can put any of these in the chat. So, so this document um, outlines technologies. It's called Owning the Weather in 2025 Weather as a Force Multiplier. 
And it outlines all the different technologies and discusses ways that we can degrade enemy forces and enhance friendly forces and um, and how these projects are executed from an air operations center for uh, planes and drones and things like that. And then uh, a couple, you know, uh, going going way, way back, I was talking about Operation Popeye, which was where the, the U.S. Um, uh, rained out. Vietnam, and we, we we essentially washed out the Ho Chi Minh Trail so the North Koreans couldn't get supplies. So that's how we ended the war. Now, we could have done this at the very beginning of the war, but but war is a money-making machine for <laughs> yeah. military contractors. So going way, way back, there's, uh, there's um, I mean, if you're going back 70 years, there's hundreds. But, but prior to this, there were dozens of different weather modification um, things, uh, it, uh, technologies. Now, one of the very, very early cloud making technologies is, is making cloud curtains during World War II because they could, they could on, a, on a kind of a still day, they could drop a massive uh, floating cloud curtain. And this thing could stay suspended for a long time. And as it broke up, it would, it would just broaden and it would block the view of people from the land to to uh, to our ourselves or our allies coming in on to shore, wow. so they could drop this from from different specific uh, different types of elevations. And I mean, this was this was seventy or now it's eighty plus years ago that that, they, that we had the technology to do this. So um, so now you know we have a department that works on weather programs and and weather modification and engineering and and DARPA. Now, if you if you go, it, mainstream media is very controlled, as I'm sure you know, because <laughs> they never hear anything about five G. Yeah. So when they do, yeah, so when they publish something, it's always fantastical, and we'll be able to do this in the future. So this is an older video from the History Channel talking about you know how we can create clouds with using this massive machine. But even before that, the U.S. military was uh, the U.S. military was was using a oh excuse me I don't know why this so this is a TMC sixty five it's it's a cloud maker it's about the size of a van and you can you can use uh, one by itself or you can line these up along a mountain range or a valley and create a massive cloud bank uh, within a few minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, depending on how big the valley is. So with weather modification and warfare, you can block the view or block satellite views by by using ground or air uh, cloud makers. And you can see the, the kind of taupe color. See this? It's not it's not a beautiful billowy white cloud. It's, it's a chemical cloud. It's an engineered cloud. So on our website, we have these videos. People can can click on our geoengineering page and see all this. So, uh, so this you know it's a tiny it's a it's a tiny tank, and it'll just keep going because nanomaterial, uh, you know, the smaller material you don't have to have a huge, huge tanks with. So the third objective in geoengineering is the commercial objective. So. So with geoengineering and weather modification and weather modification technologies, and, and you probably already know that the carbon markets, carbon credits, carbon taxes, all of this stuff is being built up. But what it does is it primarily funds big oil and it funds big oil and coal and the telecommunications industry. So yeah, there's money to be made in that. That's all I know. I've, I, I've, I haven't researched it to be fair a lot, but I know that it's a big money making activity. There's someone making a lot of money off of that idea and, you know, carbon taxing, carbon offsetting. Oh, I purchased this t-shirt and it has been carbon reimbursed. I'm always confused about what on earth does this mean? And does yeah. it mean it's more friendly for the planet? And my intuition tells me, no, probably not. It's more like a sort of scheme here going on. Yes, it's a bait and switch. So yeah. it's, it's a huge uh, deception. So um, when... Uh, LBJ discussed owning the weather as owning the world. He was he wasn't lying. Um, he wasn't exaggerating. I mean, so 
uh, a third of all industry on earth is directly connected to the weather. Uh, generally directly connected with the weather. And this includes, you know, military and communications and, and ground and space technology providers. And then all of the energy, all of the conventional energy, you have to control weather. Uh, I mean, it's, it's good if you can control the weather over, for example, over if there's a hurricane coming over a, an oil drill or set sets of sets of drills over the ocean yeah. or over the land. And you can also take out these structures through utilization of weather and, and weather warfare. Um, and then also for, for, um, for what they call green energy. So solar and wind, if you can block the sun, uh, you can, you can reduce the draw on solar panels. Um, and if you reduce the wind by either doing what's called wind stilling or just stopping the wind, you can stop the turbines or you can use ice nucleation, uh, geoengineering and you can freeze turbines and wow. then uh and then you can you can cause huge disruption in economies so uh that's just a couple things but mining and agriculture and nano and biotech and transportation and these are all things that that people like bill gates are invested in so he he wants to be able to control that e economy and, and i i mean i'm using him because everybody knows him there's there's lots of other other yeah. people involved um, other, other people. So this is a, a, just a quick example of a, of a, of a, um, partnership between Canada and India geoengineering. So they do projects, uh, different types of weather modification and carbon capture and storage that are projects that are completed and ongoing. And, and so people don't know that, that geoengineering is even a thing. So they don't think to look at these, but if you look at, look at who is making money from these, like Canadian, uh, uh, Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, you know, this is Bill Gates and Elon Musk. So they get money for wreaking havoc on the environment, you know, basically. The same way that the mining industry is exploding right now because of, because of the, the green infrastructure and smart infrastructure and all of the, the batteries that are needed. There's not enough terrestrial, uh, not enough terrestrial lithium and, cobalt so elon musk for example has has executed the largest deep ocean mining project on earth that rips a hole from from uh san diego all the way out to hawaii and he's not the only one i mean these these projects are going on everywhere and they're getting funding because it goes towards green economies and smart economies so uh, this is the, this is one of the companies is very open about their projects, weather modification incorporated. Uh, it says nearly a half century, but this would, this is an older, uh, an, an, an older about us that they have. So they're, they're 60 plus years old. So in the U S alone, they have everything listed by countries in the U S alone. They'll work with, you know, ag groups on cloud seeding, or they'll work with, um, Illinois weather modification or Naval surface warfare center. So these guys do very antiquated or their, their public projects use very antiquated technologies like cloud seeding, which is, or fog mitigation. And in some cases, hail mitigation. Um, and this is the silver lining project, uh, that was, that was done years ago, which is a, which is a, uh, emitting aerosols in, into, in, into the atmosphere. So, so these are different, different commercial projects. So you, so, so for, for commercial entities, you know, there's different things. So acquiesce uses ionizers and satellite resonance. And, and this company is now, uh, now runs by another name, but these guys are, are generally, um, they, they generally do intervention into the impacts of geoengineering. So when you get into these smaller, more advanced technologies, they can help disrupt the issues from geoengineering and and David Miles is the the CEO of the of the new project. This this project isn't out anymore. And what happens? The same thing that happens with with five G, where they where they mainstream media will pick up one thing and make people, for example, in the pandemic world, like they'll make um, Dr. Peter McCullough look bad. So mainstream media has done the same thing with David, the guy that has the one of the only technologies that is a very a uh, very much safer way to to kind of break through all of these other larger engineered
programs. But anybody, if you get a permit in the U.S. Um, from whatever whatever state uh, you're in, you know, you can even contact uh, Oliver's Travels, and they can bust a cloud so you can have a a nice, you know, cloud free wedding day. So these these these. <laughs> So, so how, how do, how do they do all of this? You know, that's a big question. How do they do it? What's, what's involved? And, and this is, um, there, there's a range of technologies. These are not all of them. These are a lot of the more well-known ones in the geoengineering world. And this, by the way, is from Climate Viewer. Um, Jim Lee is a phenomenal researcher. He's very rednecky, but he's got a Mensa mind. Uh, brilliant. He is the same, um, he's the same, uh, researcher that created weather modification history. So there's a, there's a really big crossover. I, his, his, his sites are extraordinarily well researched and we have links to all of these on all of these different um, geoengineering groups on our webpage as well. So uh, the most visible of all of the technologies are the aerosol technologies. So aerosols are dispersed through either fuel additives or, or retrofits on airplanes where tanks will emit Tanks will be hooked up to nozzles. Uh, sometimes they're existing nozzles, and other times they're retrofitted uh, on commercial and military air air airlines. But uh, aerosols are also emitted through rockets and balloons. You may have heard uh, just a few weeks ago, MIT, M Massachusetts Institute of Technology, outed a company called Make Sunsets. And Make Sunsets is just another group of young, uh, not so bright tech people <laughs> um, who decided that they wanted to block the sunlight over Mexico. So they uh, they have they have two venture capitalist groups, also a bunch of techies that know nothing about the environment or geoengineering uh, laws or regulations or or even courtesy, and. So they did a uh, what's called an uh, an SAI stratospheric aerosol injection project over Mexico, and Mexico didn't find about it out about it from them. They found out about it, I, I think, from MIT outing the Make Sunsets group. So uh, since then, the president has outlawed geoengineering, and the president does not know that geoengineering is happening right off the country in the Pacific. So if anyone knows anyone in the Mexican government, I would love to talk to them. Please hook me up with them. Um, but so MIT outed them and their project. But what MIT did not do is MIT doesn't discuss what the other U.S. universities are doing or the foundations. And there are several hundred uh, geoengineering projects with stratospheric aerosols going on every year, according to Harvard itself. And Harvard has been trying to do a project called Scopex, which is dropping aerosols in the atmosphere now for, for years. But they, they were supposed to initially do it over, um, I think it was New Mexico or Arizona, over a tribal region. And the tribe was like, nope. And so then they went to Switzerland and Switzerland said, nope. So they keep getting pushed off. But this is only their public projects. And then when it comes to rockets, you know, these rockets, uh, sounding rockets, companies like Elon Musk that's shooting these off, you know, a gazillion times because he's also doing all the Leo projects. Yeah. Uh, those cause huge problems. So the third way to, uh, to emit aerosols in a large way is through ship tracks. So ship tracks are emitting aerosols. So what, what is in these aerosols that is, that is making them, you know, create these cloud layers? Well, it is a uh, it's a scope of different uh, chemical and metal and biologic agents. The most well known of all of these agents is what's called the the the, the Wellsbach aerosol or the Wells from the Wellsbach patent, which contains aluminum, barium, strontium, um, different iron oxides, and and other elements, and also carbon black. So when you emit these nanomaterials into the atmosphere. Uh, you don't have to have, you know, millions and millions of, of jets or planes or or especially ships. Uh, you don't have to hire any extra ones. You just retrofit what you have. So there's transoceanic barges going all the time. So when when these things are 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 laying out initially, 
whoops, I don't know why this is. When these are laying out initially, oh, my uh, my video right there is not working. Um, let me see. Maybe I could do this. Oh, not gonna let me do it. Okay. So so they'll spray and then they and then they'll spread out and become become a cloud layer. So currently, over every ocean, uh, for the past almost uh, fifteen years, twenty years, every ocean on Earth is almost perpetually capped with clouds. Systems that naturally used to swirl around the northern and southern hemispheres, and, and you know, there's about six or eight atmospheric rivers going around the northern and southern hemisphere at, about, at any given time. And these used to swirl, and they'd build up moisture and release the moisture and, and keep going. But today, these engineered capped systems disrupt the natural systems. And in the evening, when the heat slows, when the, when the sun slows, that convective current stops, and clouds will generally break up. But over the ocean, they keep these clouds sitting there so they they exacerbate global warming. They heat the ocean. So the clouds don't dissipate at night and the heat doesn't escape from the Earth. And another thing it does is the way that our ozone is created is through oceanic currents. It pushes that that oxygen molecule up so that it so that it binds to that third molecule and creates the ozone layer. So. They're, they're destroying the ozone layer going in and out with all these uh, rockets and with geoengineering, and then they're not letting it rebuild. So another technology is ionospheric heaters. And the most well-known is HARP. Um, currently, Stanford is doing a project with the High Altitude uh, Rural Research Program, or uh, Active Rural Research Program. And... Um, but there's there's dozens of these ionosphere heaters, and what they'll they'll superheat points in the ionosphere, uh, and they're used for communications. They're used for weather modifications, you know, creating pressure in in the atmosphere to redirect atmospheric rivers. But they're also used to induce earthquakes, and the earthquakes in Turkey, for example, um, and Syria were engineered quakes, and they were outed by uh, by one of the senators in. Um, in uh oh i forgot what country in romania and it was it was in the world that that the um you know we we targeted them the the you know the world leaders targeted them through this geoengineering technology because uh because the the president of turkey wanted peaceful negotiations between you know china and russia and these other countries and so he walked out of a World Economic Forum meeting that was being held with um, with Klaus Schwab and kind of snubbed him. And so countries that do anything different, that don't want GMOs or that won't go along with the 5G narrative or that 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 won't go along with the, the Great Reset, you know, they get they get targeted. And uh, and, a, and, a, and a, another use of this technology was used over uh, in, in Japan for the for the quake series in Japan, uh, the Fukushima quakes. So an, another technology is cloud ionizers. Uh, with, with this technology, you don't have to have chemicals. You can use, uh, you can use uh, systems that are, that are set up in deserts or systems that are set up on mountain ranges and, and, and bring rain. We also have different laser technologies. And the laser technologies, um, one of the big stories on these laser technologies was Dubai, um, had 125 degree weather uh, a couple of years ago. So they use this technology and it did bring rain, but it also bought, brought catastrophic flooding to, to, you know, some of the regions over there. Oops. So you want to have it. You want to have a safer. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I yes, just no, said, oops. I mean, it's just oh. stupid. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm uh, to be honest, I'm just speechless about all these technologies and, and how, I mean, how? Oh, I've got I've got so many questions, but at the same time, we've got to wrap this up in one way or another. I don't know. I don't know what that leaves us with, but uh, my God! Um, and I don't want to rush through your presentation, but my, geez. So how can they? How do they think that these technologies? 
uh, are well controlled, uh, when there are unknown interactions between different projects and different technologies, military, governmental, uh, corporations, uh, research projects, and all of these uh, can interact one way or another. So how do they think that they can control these things, like precisely? Uh, uh, because because we've we've had the technology to target areas for for years with different different with the different types of technologies. Okay, so they can micromanage in in one way yeah. or another. Yeah. So so there are um, there are, are different military documents that that talk about different ways to own and control the weather, and then own and control and control us as well. So uh, can I go back to one of the slides for a sure. second? I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick example. And this, this document was written, uh, was written years ago. Um, and, and it was written after the, the one document that I discussed owning the weather in 2025, uh, weather as a force multiplier that, that had out, outlined the technologies. Now we already had, we already had these different technologies in place, um, but we we didn't have. Oh my gosh, I have so many screens open. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> but uh, but they they that was a meeting on the technologies, not on how they were going to use them, and then how advanced technologies would be used in conjunction with them. So um, maybe it's on this one. Uh, Nope, not on this one. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's a it's a, it's a document that outlines ways to um, control enemies, foreign and domestic, uh, that that partner with geoengineering and five G technologies. Okay. So um, after after that one document uh, that that I showed you, here we go. Here it is. So, so people can, people can simply, you know, once I can put the link in the side for you, if you want to, if you want to edit it in, uh, sure. later, but, uh, so, so this is called, uh, foundations 2025. And this is one of, one of, again, one of thousands of documents over the, you know, just a, a handful of years after they introduced the, the owning the weather in 2025. So, so, uh, this is a, a DOI document, Department of Interior document, or a Department of Defense document. So um, this group of several hundred military experts got together and they wanted to evaluate the futuristic, futuristic system concepts that had the best potential for U.S. air and space dominance. And you probably know already today that under um, the Operation Warp Speed, OWS, uh, Donald Trump allocated a trillion dollars each to pharmaceutical and uh, telecommunications. Yep. So a lot of the, the the telecommunications went also that money went to the space force, uh, which are space fence technologies, all the military control of the of the, the the IOT and surveillance and all of that other stuff. So anyway, there's several hundred you know high level uh, military personnel that uh, that identified different verbs to just to describe tasks so this is this is from their page so this is a mind map of how they can control enemies foreign and domestic right so up at the top here they have the analytics and everything and tracking and and synthesis synthesizing the the different systems and um being able to protect our themselves while deceiving disrupting and corrupting you know uh, the enemy and then the foundation of this is to be able to uh, to observe uh, everybody, every every enemy, uh, collect information and surveil them, and then uh, to be able to um, informationally and physically and biomedically and psychologically manipulate them. So you have within this nanomaterial that's coming down that's been found in rainwater samples and direct samples from aircraft um, where the testing has been done with permission from the FAA to follow certain aircraft and collect the, the nanomaterials. 
they have found that uh, everything from uh, these iron oxides and aluminum and, and other nanomaterials, and more, most recently graphene, is is coming out of these aerosol planes. So we are inhaling all of this, which makes us receivers and transmitters uh, for the, the the 5G IoT, you know, the whole surveillance and the internet of nano things and the internet of bio things. So the takedown of global food and ecosystems, all of that technology uh, that was being set up through these <clears throat> is now being now being used today against us. So people that, you know, years ago uh, in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, when I was presenting on on GMOs, people go, oh, they would never, it wouldn't be bad. They would never do that to us. <laughs> like, yeah, they, yeah, they would. Because if you, if you are if you own an agro, if you own a, if you're a shareholder and you, and you're a shareholder in Monsanto, Monsanto is also Pfizer. Right, they're partners under Pharmaca, and then more recently purchased by Bayer. So you have agrochemical food. You have this toxic food that that's grown with pesticides and fungicides and herbicides and all sorts of nature killing products, including humans. You you create a toxic food system, and then you sell that food dirt cheap through McDonald's and Domino's, and so people. People buy that food, including like regular General Mills products and Lucky Charms and things. People are feeding this garbage to their kids from the time their kids are really young. And they're not only eating those toxins, which build up in their in, in their body and their organs, um, creates a, a obesity and cancer and, and uh, diabetes and all a host of reproductive problems from GMOs and and uh and all sorts of other problems. So you create, uh, you have this generation that eats this toxic food and they're, they're not paying much for it, but on the back end with cancer and, and all the drugs that they're, all the illnesses that they have, the drug company make billions of dollars off of these same people that wouldn't pay a couple extra bucks to buy an organic apple over a pesticide intensive, you know, conventional apple. So, so they're smart, they create, this problem and they present it as something that's beneficial. And then on the back end, they make money. So they do it through geoengineering, blocking the sunlight. Um, people are going to start getting more and more sick. We're not going to be able to, our bodies won't be able to produce vitamin D. All the plants uh, will be dead and dying. All the pollinators will be gone. So who is, <clears throat> what's, the, what's the alternative to that? The alternative is purchasing genetically engineered foods that are grown indoors or that are genetically engineered to grow in low sunlight and aluminum resistant uh, soils uh, or aluminum loaded soils and things like that. And this is just a kind of a, a little bit of the scope of things that they do. And, and, and people ask, you know, why are they doing this? For them, it's a game. You know, billionaires, uh, you don't become a billionaire because you're a good person. You, you become a billionaire. N nobody needs billions of dollars, let alone one billion dollars. People through the entire pandemic have been starving in Africa and India, and Bill Gates has sent them shots to get jabbed, not set up infrastructure for organic farming or any of this stuff. He is, uh, and it's not just him, it's, it's, it's all of them. The Republicans think Musk is some superhero because he opened up Twitter Without yeah. even thinking that that they're being everything they're doing is being documented and and that the same way that um what's the actor's name with the English accent that's he's everybody's hero now but he's a <laughs> huge Illuminati guy uh, uh, I don't I, I don't I'm not aware of that uh, Russell Brand nobody's questioning why Russell Brand you know he's talking about all of the freedom issues but no one's questioning why. He has never been banned from Facebook and never been banned from YouTube when all of these other physicians and scientists and and politicians even have been banned from, from those same outlets. So there's there's um, controlled opposition in, in all of these areas, in weather and climate, in the IoT industries and in, in the agrochemical and chemical and the whole transhumanistic agenda is is being rolled out right now and the foundation of all of it is geoengineering 
you you can you control these industries you make the earth very toxic and unhealthy and and uh and it provides a it provides a a manner for communications to occur only where you want it and only when you want it and then the 5g iot the the internet of things the internet of nano and bio things these things all sit on top of that so so this is all connected and and it's all by design and the design of it is to get rid of get rid of people who are useless and and i totally understand that my gosh for freaking you know the past 30 years it drives me freaking nuts to see people who are careless about the but it's not my decision they are making that decision for themselves and I'm not saying, you know, I don't want to kill people. I'm just saying, you know, I understand now they think people are, because people are, they're, they're lazy, mentally lazy, I'm talking about. And, and yeah. um, you have a lot of people who work really hard, but they get home and then they, they, they kick back and they say, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to save the world for my kids or do anything for my kids because I'm already working and feeding them. And they don't realize that it's going to, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very, precarious position we're in right now yeah it's still at least my god yeah this is a lot it gave me a lot of uh, food for thought uh and not these are not easy thoughts to have easy discussions to have but i'm glad that you unpacked the the whole geoengineering uh issue for us because i i was not aware of a fraction of these things uh so I, you know i cannot comment on on all the links you've made but uh i really applaud for your presentation was extremely well made and basically is essentially just mainstream mainstream sources which is very very difficult to deny that this is happening at this point if i i don't know what argument people could have maybe arguments that i've received around emfs uh namely oh no this is all bullshit Right. Some people have been have been told that uh, uh, one um, one journalist, uh, André Fauteur from uh, the Montreal Gazette back back in the days, had decades of experience. And uh, it, oh no, it was at La Presse. And he basically his new boss at one point said, you know, all the reporting you've been doing on radio frequency radiation or magnetic fields from power lines, it's all bullshit. So you're fired. And he's like, okay, well, that I guess that's how now we, you know, it's, so there's no, oftentimes there's no basis for criticism. That's that that's what I found in, in many topics. When it comes to geoengineering, what I heard from people that are quote unquote skeptic is it's all BS. But most of the people that tell me EMF, uh, you know, there's nothing to see here. It's all BS. Some people have told me on social media, there's zero studies showing harm. <laughs> Not arguing, you know, it's 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 almost, yeah, it is laughable because they, they really argue, like their position is there is zero studies showing any proof of harm. At best, you could say, oh, the studies are inconclusive. You could say it is a mixed evidence, like you've got negative and you've got positive. No, 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 they say there are zero studies. And I'm like, okay, well, if you say that, you're, you're just writing a belief as fact. And, and it is, now I see through that. I used to almost be afraid of, you know, people with certain um, education levels that say, oh, no, this is BS. But I realized that most of them have not reviewed the evidence. So when it comes to geoengineering, I was completely green before this presentation. And now my thought is, it's probably very, very, very bad because these guys, if, if my experience is with EMFs and different technologies that are rolled first, and then you shoot first, you ask questions later kind of thing, bring the lawsuits, the consequences of nature, well, it's not that we don't care about nature, but it's not our responsibility. Then you go to the FCC. Well, it's not our responsibility either as the FDA. You go to the FDA as the FCC and you're like, wait a minute. So you're telling me that no one is responsible for anything, right? Correct. It's it, it's all, it's, it's almost... There's not initially, to me, I see some people have agendas, uh, money, power, but there's a lot of people 
in positions of power that are just saying it's not my job. It's not my job. It will be these guys that will take care of the environment and the I don't know. And, and and now it's in the hands of the FDA that is highly captured and they go to the FCC that is itself highly captured and you end up having no one that is there for citizens, normal people who want to, what do we want? Be happy, have a healthy planet, right? A lot of people start, when they hear about the planet, they say, what can I do? Uh, they start recycling. They try to do little things. And I guess it brings me, I want to wrap this up because it's a, 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 it's been so enlightening, but I want to keep it on a, a, on a shorter side usually. But what can we do now? I mean, geoengineering, they could, I guess, share this interview, have at least a discussion. What do you think about geoengineering? And if someone says it's all BS, well, maybe send them some slides, you know, some parts of the video and say, Oh, wait a minute. Well, I'm against, like, I hope these things have been tested prior or they probably, you know, have done some impact studies before rolling these out. And okay, well, let's look at these impact studies, right? Let's, let's spark the discussion. But when it comes to the everyday things that we can do and bring it back to pollinators or it, what is the conclusion here? And in your advocacy, you probably talk about solutions. It seems such like a, a large daunting problem. What can I do about it? That's one of my questions, in fact. So what can what can we do? Um, well, there are uh, there are there are a, a lot of uh, a lot of things you can do. First, first thing is to to learn about these technologies and their and their partnerships, and and that does take time. It, it takes a little bit of time, but if you if you can't explain uh, what what you if you can't explain if you can't answer the questions you send people to so so our website for example um, our, our website is is divided we have our our, our introductory page uh, can I share can I do this in case people wanna sure come on okay. So uh, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna run through this really quickly. So so this is our our web page, and so if people want to learn about pollinators and how to how to help pollinators, they, they can come to this page. Um, we have we have different uh, different topics, and you you know you mentioned recycling, and people think that for example is gonna help the environment. It really it really doesn't. In, yeah, in, it's in the, in kind the, of bad. In the, yeah. Yeah, in the three R's, you've heard of reduce, reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the three R's, they're put in that order for a reason. If you reduce, if you if you think about in conscious consumerism, you think about you know if you need to buy something, and and who is involved or what is involved in that product, and then where is it going to end up, blah blah blah. Um, reducing consumption, not buying things you don't need, is 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 a huge part of that, and then. In the reuse, in the reuse of prod products, either in the same capacity or a different capacity, um, and then and then shopping for organic and fair trade and animal friendly products and things like that. For example, if you want to help pollinators, uh, a lot of websites say, "Hey, you know, buy buy this little bee charm," you know, and and you're. You'll help us save the pollinators. Well, you can't you can't save the pollinators if you're if you're doing a bunch of mining and then making a necklace <laughs> and and then shipping it across the country. You know, you're destroying habitat and you know chemicals and all that stuff. Uh, and if someone's selling a T-shirt, they say we're pollinator friendly. There's a million pollinator uh, groups out there that that sell T-shirts, and it's just conventional cotton. And conventional cotton is one of the most pesticide intensive and yeah. water intensive crops in, in the world. And most of it is genetically engineered. And I mean, I'm not even going to get into the farmer suicides in India who were duped into buying Monsanto's BT corn. Mm. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you, if you go to a, a place, you want to make sure they have uh, or, organic cotton or hemp or some, or an eco-friendly, <clears throat> more environmentally friendly fabric. So, so that's one thing, but, the best thing for pollinators is to support their ecosystems. Buying true organic and and true organic or biodynamic foods, um, true natural foods that that have 
no or low chemicals at the at the best. So when you do this, when you're buying these foods, you're supporting these clean ecosystems that allow millions of different animals in from from uh, beetles to ants to hummingbirds and bats. You know, you're what you want to do is keep these environments really clean. Um, so, so we have this page that discusses other other topics as well, and you can click on on any of these, like for bat pollinators or pollinator friendly yards, blah blah blah. And then we have a page called Five G and the Bee, and this covers the issues of Five G. We have some short videos. Um, we also have different websites for for people to visit. Now, this a lot of this is is human and environmental uh, health. As, as you know, and then we have this awesome podcast here. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> but uh, but we have ways to where people can be proactive. And these are just introductory so people can can really take a good look. And then if people want to download, um, we have documents. Uh, Cindy Russell is phenomenal. Wireless Silent Spring. So these these outline the different issues for different animals. And then for human health impacts, we have the same. And then we offer links to pages where people can get uh, everything from uh, from from uh, EMF readers to other products. And then uh, we're currently working with Spiro. Spiro has a uh, Spiro has a a little um, device. This is a smaller one. It's called the Spiro Square. And right now they're making these. Uh, for these humans use these as well. They don't, they don't block 5G. They break up the millimeter waves. So you still get, you still get the resonance from earth. Uh, the, 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 the engineer of this technology, his wife 20 years ago became uh, ill from uh, EMFs and he was an engineer and he worked for the telecommunications industry, I think. So he had designed stuff for her over this whole time. And then, because of 5G, he redesigned these. So these can even be slid right into a right into a um, a hive, and you put this in, and it adds extra protection within the hive against EMFs. Now, the structure of cells within the hive, what we call honeycombs, these cells in the hive, those are actually an extraordinary anti-EMF device. But when the bees leave the hive, they have problems, and when they come back. They're influenced because because millimeter waves, you know, they penetrate the top two millimeters of, of our bodies. For us, it's nothing. But for insects like bees, it superheats their their bodies internally. Mm -hmm. Oh, so um, and and maybe next time we can touch on um, a company called Oxytech with genetically engineered mosquitoes and how 5G causes them to proliferate. So. Oh, really? <clears throat> Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so, uh, another problem on the horizon, right? It's, it, there's yeah. always more. <laughs> yeah, they're they're constantly there. Yeah, they've they've been working on this for a long time. So so that's our five G page, and then for geoengineering, um, our geoengineering page does a basic introduction, and then we go through uh, basic overviews of of what's occurring and how mainstream media is manipulated, as you well know, as with five uh, G. And then if people want to want to just see world weather maps, if they want to see an overall view of the map, the, the, the earth and its systems, whether it's a one time satellite or wind or water. And when you see these massive anomalies, it lets you understand that that these other things are happening. And if you want to take rainwater sampling, this shows you where to go to take water samples from a certified lab they do overflows for universities and sometimes independent projects and then um this uh this is an image of what's called a wingtip to wingtip sprayer and then this was the the tmc 65 i showed you mm -hmm. and um and then there's uh the documents owning the the weather in 2025 and then these next series are different uh, different websites and different professionals that focus on different aspects of geoengineering. And one of the most well-known organizations is Dane Wigington's Geoengineering Watch. Um, and I have this kind of broken up so people don't have to go through the whole project. He recently did a documentary called The Dimming. And then um, 
Jim Lee's uh, websites, Weather Modification History, and Climate Viewer, which has maps of of um, ge- geo maps and geopolitical maps and patents and um, projects. He is he's he's a great researcher himself. And and then uh, these are these are uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Doctor. Uh, um, Dr. Marvin Herndon and Mark Whiteside. They're a physicist and an infectious disease specialist. And they have, uh, they have dozens of peer reviewed published papers <clears throat> on geoengineering impacts on the environment, impacts on wildfires, impacts on health, how it was used during the, uh, during the pandemic and, and everything else. And this is Dr. Rosalind Peterson. She is a, uh, she, she passed away uh, very recently. Um, she was older and she wasn't doing well and uh, not from any COVID related stuff, okay. but um, she was a, 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 a brilliant um, activist and she was a USDA um, ag inspector and crop loss adjuster. And this is her presentation. It's very short in uh, t- 2007 on geoengineering commercial and military impacts on agriculture in California and around the world. And then uh, this is another uh, wonderful introduction to geoengineering. It's called Why in the World Are They Spraying? Um, Michael Murphy was the the documenter. Uh, This was put out, I think, also in 2007. It was one one of the first very, very well done integrated uh, documentaries that I saw on the topic. And uh, unfortunately, Michael Murphy was targeted uh, just weeks before his his documentary came out in 20, I think it was supposed to come out in 2014. Um, he, uh, he, he was completely targeted and went off the deep end um, he was very happy and healthy and very excited about his new documentary coming out. It was called Unconventional Gray. Uh, and then they, they took him out. And something similar happened with Dane Wigington when his documentary came out. His, uh, his editor had overnighted him a, a package of the final cuts of the documentary, The Dimming. And that night he had a massive heart attack and Dane Wigington never got the package. So they had to hire another editor and redo the whole thing. So it was delayed, but it's out now. So um, this is from uh, a group called Tanker Enemy. Rosario Marciano is phenomenal Italian activist. And he he uh, works with uh, two, two scientists on this documentary. It also is an older documentary, um, but they, they discuss geoengineering and the biologic impacts. And the, uh, they got tests. They were one of the first groups to go up and get testing directly from emissions from the plane. This is, a, a, this is Dr. Peter, Dr. Um, Rosalind Peterson's website. So you can go through her stuff here. Dr. Russell Blaylock discusses the neurologic impacts. Uh, this is a, a scientist or excuse me, a meteorologist who was, who was given an option to leave with a $2 million package. Uh, if he did not mention geoengineering uh, ever again, otherwise he wasn't allowed to mention geoengineering um, as a meteorologist on his uh, Colorado uh, newscast for a commercial um, entity. And this is Nick, uh, Dr. Begich, um, who who d- has a great book called Angels Don't Play This Harp. And the video is great. It discusses the harp technology. And that's an older version Today, ionospheric heaters are all over the world. And the, one of the newer ones called ISCAT is a hundred times larger than, than the heart facility. Wow. And then this covers Morgellons disease uh, and uh, the, the parallels in Lyme disease. Um, Clifford Carnicom, who is the primary research, researcher for Carnicom Institute, also works with Dr. Anna Macalia and Dr. David Nixon. And they do all the nanomaterial, nanostructures, and nano um, self as- self assembling nanostructure studies of vaccinated and unvaccinated blood. So you can find him through this. And then um, in taking action for geoengineering, there's different websites. Uh, Dane Wigington has a legal team that's working on 
on a on an on a on a national and uh, U.S. Canadian lawsuit, among other things, I think. And and then Dave and then um, Jim Lee is is trying to to get funding to rewrite the United Nations Enmod Treaty to actually hold uh, countries and corporations and individuals accountable for their projects. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's a, it's a crime against humanity and the environment. So that's, that's my geoengineering, uh, and environment. And then we have buds for bees, which discusses the hemp industry impacts on bees. We have brews and bees because we used to tour, um, coffee shops and breweries and do presentations at those. So we have the bee friendly breweries, uh, and then the bee friendly spirits companies, because they were part of our mixers donating products. And then Bucks for Bees is our fundraising um, page. We, we, we need funding very badly right now. We're working on different projects, including uh, getting a team together for a separate geoengineering lawsuit. And then Pandemic and Pollinators covers the, the parallels and integration of the takedown of global eco and food systems with uh, with the current um, false flag uh, pandemic event. And then these are different resources. Tremendous. Well, that's an amazing review. And I hope that people love the uh, at least the deep. I think I think it's a deep introduction into uh, geoengineering and then the consequences. Uh, and also how can you can help pollinators and whatnot. We're going to have links to all of this. And if you can, uh, send me the PDF of your presentation, if you're willing, if uh, that can help some people or people can look at the different links. And I'm going to try to uh, include as many of these uh, that you mentioned as possible in the show notes. Uh, anything else you wanted to mention before we go, Nikki? Thank you so much for your presence uh, on the Smart Tech Podcast. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for having me. I think you're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, it's been uh, it's been lovely. And uh, I hope to have you again in the future to maybe go into uh, one of these other topics uh, that we've uh, barely touched about. But if, I feel like this could have been a 12 hour conversation. So I'm glad we were able to keep it to 90 minutes just to be for it to be digestible. But it's something that I think I'll digest for uh, a few days at least. So thank, thanks for that. These are just very daunting, but very important topics to discuss. So thank you for your work. Yes, thank you, Nick.